In this video, we're going to talk about exponents and radicals. And in addition to understanding how to set up and use exponent and radical notation, we're going to try to dig beneath the surface and understand why that notation actually functions the way it does. Let's begin by thinking about what happens when we take a number and add it to itself repeatedly. So what we're looking at here, of course, is the number 3 being added to itself four times. Well, if you add a number to itself over and over again, it can be kind of tedious to write down the entire sum. And it's basically for that reason why we invented the idea of multiplication. A much more convenient and concise way to write this sum is, of course, as 3 times 4. All right, so let's ask a related question. What if we want to take a number and multiply it by itself repeatedly? So what if we want to take that same number 3, for instance, and multiply it by itself four times? Once again, it'd be nice if we can write this product in a more compact and simplified form. Uh, and this is precisely why so-called exponential notation was invented. We can take the product of 3 by itself four times and write it this time as 3 raised to the power 4 or 3 raised to the exponent 4. So in general, the notation works like this. If we take some arbitrary real number x and choose to multiply it by itself n times, then we would write the result as x raised to the power n. And there's some special terminology that goes hand in hand with this notation. The number n here is known as the exponent, hence exponential notation, or power of x to the n. And the number x is what we call the base of the exponential expression. What we're going to try to do next is see if we can uncover any special properties that exponential notation should satisfy. And we'll begin by considering a natural case, uh, namely the case of two exponential expressions with the same base being multiplied by one another. So here we have x to the power 3 being multiplied by x to the power 5. The question is, is there any way in which we can simplify this or work with this in a convenient manner? Well, let's think a little bit about the underlying meaning of each of these two expressions. Indeed, x raised to the power 3 is just equal to x times x times x. So we're multiplying x by itself three times. And then x to the power 5 is equal to x times x times x times x times x, right? x multiplied by itself five times. So what we have here is, if we count it up, just eight copies of the number x being multiplied by itself. Our new expression, in other words, is equal to x raised to the power 8. And it is, of course, no accident that 8 is exactly equal to 3 plus 5. This insight leads us to our first general property of exponents. Our first general property of exponents says that if we multiply x to the power m times x to the power n, then the result can simply be written as x to the power m plus n. And here x is an arbitrary real number, and m and n are two natural numbers. Let's take another look at an expression involving exponents and see if we can't simplify it as well. What we're looking at here is an exponential expression, x to the power 3, which is itself being raised to an exponent, namely the exponent 4. Right? So what happens if we raise an exponential expression to an exponent? Well, again, let's just appeal to the definition of what exponentiation means. If we take x cubed, x to the 3, and raise it to the power 4, that means that we should take x to the 3 and multiply it by itself four times, like so. But of course, we know from the property of exponents that we just discussed uh, that this can be simplified as x to the 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3, right? We just want to add the exponents together. And that, of course, is equal to x 
to the power of 3 times 4, which is equal to x to the power 12. So it turns out that we just wanted to multiply those two original exponents together. This leads us to our second general property of exponents, which says that when we take x to the power m and raise it to the power n, then the result will be x to the power m times n. I do want to take a minute to issue a quick warning, however. It's important to understand that the parentheses play a very important role in our notation here. So x to the power m in parentheses raised to the power n is an expression to which property number 2 applies. But please note that this is not equal to x to the m to the power n without parentheses. That's usually a very different number. So for example, 2 to the power 10 in parentheses raised to the power 3 is, by our property, 2 to the power 30, which is a billion and change. And that's a large number. But 2 to the power 10 to the power 3 without parentheses is equal to 2 to the 1,000. And that is an almost incomprehensibly huge number. It is much, much greater than the estimated number of electrons in the entire universe. Let's press on and see what else we can discover about exponential expressions. What we're looking at here is one exponential term, namely x to the power 5, divided by another exponential term, x to the power 3. Again, let's ask the question, is there a way that we can simplify this expression? And once again, there is. And we can think about this by appealing, once again, to the definition of exponential notation. The numerator of our fraction is x multiplied by itself five times, just like this. And the denominator of our expression is x multiplied by itself three times. And as soon as we write the fraction out like this, we of course notice that, well, as long as x isn't zero, which would give us a nonsensical expression, there is quite a bit of cancellation that takes place. Namely, each copy of x in the denominator will cancel with one copy of x in the numerator. And after the smoke clears, we are just left with x to the power 2, just two copies of x multiplied by one another. How does the number 2 relate to the number 5? And the number 3, well, notice how this is just equal to x to the 5 minus 3. Now for a different but related question. What if we take those two exponential terms, x cubed and x to the power 5, and divide them in the opposite order? What will happen now? Well, writing things out as before, we now have three copies of x in the numerator and five copies of x in the denominator. And this time, the cancellation will work as I'm indicating here. Everything in the numerator will cancel out with something in the denominator. And after the smoke clears here, we are left with 1 over x squared. Now notice how if we try to apply the same principle as before, namely the principle of subtracting exponents, we would have to do x to the power 3 minus 5. And that is equal to x to the negative 2. This leads us to our next couple properties of exponents, which tell us that x to the m divided by x to the n is equal to x to the m minus n. Here we just subtract the exponents, the exponent in the numerator minus the exponent in the denominator. And relatedly, and this is basically a consequence of property 3, if we have a negative exponent on our hands, or an exponent with a minus sign in front of it, x raised to the power minus n, then we can rewrite that as 1 over x to the n. And the special case of property 3 that's worth pointing out is the case when m and n are both equal to 1. Note that in that case, we have x over x, which would be by our property x to the 0. And that x over x, as long as x itself is not 0, will of course always be equal to 1. Therefore, 
a number raised to the power zero, unless that number is zero, will always be equal to one. There's one more important property of exponents that we need to discuss. Let's consider it once again by way of an example. What I want you to think about here is that we're going to take some real number x and raise it to a mystery power indicated by a green question mark here, and then square the result and obtain the number x itself. Okay, so basically the question here is x raised to what power squared will give us x? And if we think about property number three of exponents, we can try to reason about this in the following way. We can notice that x on the right hand side of my equation is the same as x to the power one. And that the left hand side of the equation by our property number three is equal to x to that question mark times two. So the idea is that comparing exponents here should sort of lead us to the notion that two times our question mark exponent uh, is equal to one. And that means, of course, solving this very simple equation uh, that the mystery exponent would have to equal one half, right? The upshot here is that it can make sense to take a real number and raise it to a fractional exponent. In particular, x raised to the power one half is a number that we call the square root of x. So in general, a real number x raised to the power one over n, a fractional power, will equal the so-called nth root of x, which simply means that x to the power one over n is a number which, when multiplied by itself n times, gives us x. Now there are a number of things to say about the nth root of a real number, so let's look at a few examples to hopefully clear things up. Our first example is asking us to consider the second root or the square root of the number negative four. But if you think about this for a moment, you'll realize that there's a problem because it is clearly impossible to take a real number, square it, that is to say, multiply it by itself and obtain a negative number as a result. So what we have to say here is that minus four raised to the power one half is actually not a real number. It is, for our purposes, undefined. Example number two, on the other hand, is asking us to think about a number which is the cube root of negative eight, a number which, when multiplied by itself three times, will give us negative eight. Notice that this time there is such a number, and that number is simply minus two, right? Minus two multiplied by itself three times gives us minus eight. And example number three asks us to consider the fourth root of the number 16. So now we're trying to look for a number which, when multiplied by itself four times, will give us 16. And if you think a little bit, you should realize that the number two does the job. But not so fast, because there's actually another solution here. The number negative two works just as well minus two multiplied by itself four times is also equal to 16. So sometimes a number can have multiple nth roots. And in fact, that will happen in general precisely when x to the one over n is such that n is even. This leads us to the following very important bit of notation that is known as radical notation. When we take a real number x and write it under this radical sign with a number n as a superscript, it means that we want to take the principal nth root of x. The principal nth root is equal to x to the power 1 over n if n is odd, because in that case there's only one nth root to speak of. And in the case when n is even, then the principal nth root is simply the non-negative value of x to the one over n, because there may be both a positive and a negative nth root. So the principal nth root will just be the positive one. And one final thing to take note of is that 
by convention, the radical sign on its own implicitly means that n is equal to 2. In other words, that we're going to take the non-negative square root of x.